Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I've been grappling with this. I plagiarized my buns off for a couple of weeks on this. So, but this is a, an original piece which I'm going to spring on you right now. And I, I was looking through my um, the notes of some of my rhymes. I don't call them poems. And I found one from 1994, and I don't know why I wrote this, but I did. Natives once lived here in bands. White pine trees covered the lands. Lake waters lapped at the beaches and rocks. Here, a town site would be grand. The railroad had built its main line across the land through the great stands of pine. Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Omaha to Bayfield at the end of its line. In 1883, a new town was certain to be where railroad meets water, a dock would be built so goods could be shipped on our sea. The harbor, to a said, was the best of any known in the Midwest. It was natural and deep, large ships it could keep. As a dock site, it sure met the test. So we'll carry on from there. This beautiful area named Shawamigan by the early French fur traders sometime after their arrival in 1658 has been the home of various bands of Native Americans as early as 5,000 years ago. And I want to tell you how I picked that number. I was at a um, Apostle Islands Lakeshore history program a few years ago and the guy said that they had found some fire ring on one of the islands and they carbon dated the charcoal, it was 5,000 years old. Can't tell you what island. So I thought that was interesting. Anyway, the explorers Radisson, Radisson and Grossier noted on their 1658 visit to Shawanigan Bay, which was as yet, as yet unnamed, that up to 4,000 natives of up to seven different bands inhabited the Bay Area, largely near the Bad River and Fish Creek. They suggested that the bay seemed to be a resort area for natives of the region. Copper was being mined by someone on Isle Royal before the white men arrived and transported over the lake and rivers to the Gulf of Mexico and beyond. This traditional transportation network stood the fur traders in good stead as they collected their booty from the Shawabagan and Lake Superior region and transported it to Europe. Uh, transportation by water from rail was what motivated the Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Omaha Railroad over two centuries later to forge ahead with their plan to establish the Lake Superior shipping port on the Bayfield Peninsula, which was 60 miles nearer and four hours faster to eastern destinations than their competitors in Duluth Superior. Try that. There we go. There we go. Oh, good, we're in Mason. <laughs> now try the Omaha road map. That's the next one. There we go. There was a vast market for western grain to go east and for eastern coal and general merchandise to go west. Great were the political and financial manipulations to finally gain rights for the rail line completion from Minneapolis St. Paul to Lake Superior at Bayfield. Doing so would complete the connection to and from all the existing Omaha Road's vast network. And this is not the whole network, this is the northern end of it, but it goes clear down to Omaha, Nebraska, and it gets to Chicago and Milwaukee, and pretty interesting. Next. Bayfield was elated when the line to their fair city was completed in 1892 for mighty were the expectations for a great rail to lake shipping port. Barely was the paint dry on the new depot in Bayfield when the railroad announced that they had selected Washburn for the site of their great new shipping facility. They justified their decision on several factors. One, there were two grades of 80 feet to the mile north of Washburn, not conducive for, for transporting heavy freight. Two, 
There was a limited lakefront space in Bayfield for a terminal as large as they desired. Three, Washburn had a natural, more sheltered harbor with a water depth of 24 feet, which did not require dredging. And four, Washburn had enough space and a grade to the water conducive for heavy freight traffic. Next. Washburn is a product of the Omaha Railroad. In 1883, the Bay Land and Improvement Company, a subsidiary of the railroad, surveyed and platted the 366-acre town site and sold building lots. Next. The city was laid out in an east-west plane parallel with the hillside, hence the stretched out configuration we suffer today. <laughs> Plenty of space was allotted for railroad access to their facility and the sawmills, which would follow in 1885. Notice that big blank space there right north of the coal dock? That's all land that they reserved for whatever they wanted to use it for. Fortunately for us. Next. Uh, let's see now, oh, where am I? I lost my train of thought. Oh yes, the city was named for Cadwallader C. Washburn, who had a key role in shaping Minneapolis into a leading flour milling center, and it was fitting that the flour and coal port should bear his name. C.C. was engaged in Wisconsin and Minnesota politics and business, and he made a fortune in the process. He was elected governor of Wisconsin in 1871. Uh, 1885, probably. Uh, I see Walker High School is not there yet. Pretty early on, 84, 85, something like that. And lots of stumps there yet. And the little little building in the bottom right-hand corner, right to, to the upper right of that boxcar, is Dan Webster Corning's first store. Right there. That's it. Daniel West, his Pioneer Supply Store, which carried everything from overshoes and socks to groceries and medicine, mostly for the workmen who would build the new terminal facilities. Dan has uh, surviving relatives in town to this day. He has a granddaughter, um, Grace, who's 94 and lives up at uh, Northern Lights. He has great grandchildren, Dan W. Um, and uh, he has a uh, grand great granddaughter Caroline Holm and her sister Kathy and they have children so I won't get too far into that. Anyway, time marches on. Uh, next. There's old Daniel. And next. And Washburn and you can see here the uh, askewed layout where the west half of town faces south and the east half faces southeast. And I have I always kind of deplored that arrangement because I'm in the southeast facing part and I don't get the sun when I want it. <laughs> Dang it. Next. Anyway, let me read what I got written down here. The west half of the city faces southeast half of the blah, 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 To enjoy views of the lake which must have been substantial during following the cutover as the name Grandview Avenue suggests. And here we have the, the city and a drawing of this magnificent complex. The coal dock was the first of the three facilities which the railroad company would construct. The second being the merchandise dock and finally the grain elevator dock and the elevator. Information of how the facilities were constructed is given by Captain John A. Jacobs in the Lake Superior Country in History and Story by Guy Burnham, uh, a publication of which I recommend if you're into local history. It's really got a lot of interesting stuff in it. Since the lake bed was sandstone at the dock site and pilings could not be driven, cribs had to be constructed. The cribs were filled with stone brought down from a, by a scow from a quarry east of what is now Memorial Park. The front and sides of the dock were built of 12 by 12 timbers which were rafted across the bay from a mill in Ashland. Inside the crib work, the filling was composed of call logs, stone, and dirt. 
The call logs were picked up along the shore from the head of the bay to Washburn. Leftover logs were plentiful, a mere 80 rods from shore, as loggers only took the best timber. These logs were skidded by horse teams to the water and dumped into a large boom, which then towed them to the site and through an opening in the cribbed area. Later, they were stacked eight to 10 tiers high and covered with rock. Following that, the rock was covered with clay excavated from the area north of the site, pretty much where we're sitting now. Many chunks of pure copper were found in this clay. One pile had better than two tons of chunks, from the size of an egg to as large as a football. Several smaller piles were taken from different parts of the cut. Next. Once the dock was completed, a complex coal handling structure of wood and steel was built on which steam-driven buckets would travel overhead to extract coal from the ships. Next. Pretty interesting. Uh, this is the, these are the first time I've had a chance to view this interesting structure. And I've certainly never seen the buckets before. Next. Another shot of this structure from the southwest, and note the blocks of sandstone there in the foreground being ready to be transported somewhere, or maybe used in the elevator, that's a possibility. Next, and here we see the completed structure with the boat pulled up. And this, uh, Tom Manley just showed me a postcard. The date of the postcard with this picture on it was 1913. Next. So here's the same black and white picture, but I call your attention in the background. There's another plume of smoke way to the right. In fact, there's two plumes of smoke. Now, there's two possibilities. One is the steam power plant at the pumping station. Secondly, there was a well, or a, a well, there was a, a sawmill in the ravine just west of Memorial Park at a place they called McClellan. I can't remember the, the name of the sawmill operator, but there's two, two possibilities. And the small white plume, it looks more like to me, might be the sawmill. And the big, taller plume would be from the smokestack of the pump house. Next. The second dock to be built was the merchandise dock. Much of the work was done during the winter. The contractors, Balk and Henry, had a winter road on the ice to Ashland, over which were hauled the square timbers, slabs, and edgings from the Ashland mills. The road was kept nicely plowed out at all times and was marked by small spruce and balsam trees placed about 100 feet apart. During the open water season, the contractors used two tugs and scows. The scows were used to haul stone from the company's quarry, again, east of Washburn. I looked for it Sunday, I couldn't find it. And for hauling slabs and edgings from Ashland and Pike's Mill in Bayfield. The 12 by 12 square timbers were towed from Ashland in large booms, generally at night when it was more calm, and during the day if it was calm enough. Next. How we see the... Uh, picture of the merchandise dock, and they're, they're scarce, they're really hard to find. This is the only one I could get my hands on from this view, looking at it from the uh, southeast. East. Uh, once, um, this is from Katherine Johnson's book that she wrote, Washburn Memories. Once the dock was completed, a large storage building, which covered all but a perimeter loading area of the dock, was constructed. By 1896, it was a busy place, employing over 40 men, handling the transfer of freight from Buffalo and this port, which was the late terminal for Twin City Freight. Next. Another view, this time looking at it from the, the west side with a boat moored alongside. Next. I'm guessing that Olson Dray Line, started by William Olson, great-grandfather of Dick and Bill, of today's Olson building materials, and Ungroat Hardware, started by Ben Ungroat, grandfather of Bob, 
would have done business with this merchandise facility. And I call your attention that the dating item in this building is that hay uh, hook up there above the hay loft door, which is now more than half covered. Um, but this barn at, at the time would have housed the horses, the hay, and the building materials. I talked to uh, Terry Welty at the golf course at Iron River on Monday. I thought Terry might show up here today. He remembers riding in the rig with, uh, with Olaf, who was his grandfather. Terry is now 92, but he rode the rig with his grandfather, Olaf, and remembers delivering things about the community, and I thought he'd say something about that today, but unfortunately he's not here. And next, Ungrowth Hardware, and of course both of these establishments, you remember, were founded in 1886. And we lost Robert last week, uh, his funeral was Saturday, unfortunately. In 1920, the commercial dock shed was demolished by a Cleveland wrecking company, creating a serviceable open dock space. Next. There's a pile of rubble, that might be all that's left of the building, I'm not sure. Next. Work started on the third dock for the elevator in the fall of what turned out to be a very balmy one, in which no time was lost to bad weather. It was built on massive cribbing filled with stone, 160 piers, and an additional 5,000 cubic feet of stone completed the underwater details. The dock was completed a few days before Christmas in 1885. <coughs> Next. Construction of the one million barrel grain elevator designed by George Moulton and Company of Chicago would begin soon after and was completed in 1886. The elevator was 84 feet by 225 feet and 149 feet high from the water line. Some 36,000 feet of oak planking and 24,000 pounds of sheet iron went into the project. The elevator had 10 storage bins. Next. Sioux City Engine and Iron Works supplied the elevator engine. It was a 700 horsepower tandem compound single crank giant, whatever that means, with cylinder dimensions of 24 by 36 by 44 inches. The flywheel, flywheel weighed 12 tons and the bandwheel was 13 feet in diameter. Steam came from 220 pound pressure boilers topped off with a 150 foot tall smokestack. This machinery could empty 240 cars of grain per day, six at a time. Twelve spouts could load two vessels simultaneously. The cost to construct was $225,000. It was completed on March 17, 1886. Next. F.H. Peavy Company was chosen to operate the facility. The first cargo was shipped on 6, 1886. Competition for the grain business and rate wars doomed this elevator operation, which was short-lived. In 1908, it was used by a company to ship salt. The elevator was demolished prior to World War I. Next. Meanwhile, back in, Bay back in Bayfield, earlier disappointed for missing out on the shipping terminal, the railroad was responsible for developing a substantial increase in tourist traffic from cities far away like Chicago, Omaha, Nebraska, and others on the Omaha lines. Folks came for the cool air, the lake, and the scenery. And up Washington Avenue is the Isle View Hotel. And this is not a real good view of it, but it's one of the best choices I could get my hands on. Uh, it burned at some point not too long down the road after this picture. Next. To boost its passenger business, the Omaha promoted Bayfield and the area as a resort. Colonel Frederick M. Woods of Lincoln, Nebraska came to Madeline Island in the 1890s 
to enjoy the cool island life and left Nebraska row in his wake. The enclave still stands. This trade for the railroad lasted into the 1930s, of course, when the automobile became popular. Next. Local train service between Ashland and Bayfield was provided twice a day by the Scoot. It also connected at Ashland Junction with service to the Twin Cities and others on the Omaha line. The Scoot service ended in 1934, after roads and the auto traffic became popular. Next. The North, Northwestern Fuel Company, which operated the coal dock early on, selected John Gibson as its superintendent of operations, which began in 1896. Early business was brisk. The coal dock employed as many as 40 men when boats were being unloaded, and there was a regular crew of 18 to 20. Next. Uh, that's not the right one. Back up. be in trouble here. Well, anyway, it had 16 unloading rigs. Its capacity was 110,000 tons of coal. In 1910, Northwestern Fuel Company loaded 40 to 70 cars of coal per day. Two railroad switch crews and 70 men were employed. Next. During a period beginning with the founding of the DuPont Explosives Plant at Barksdale in 1905 and through the First and Second World Wars, the dock facility got a boost in business supplying coal for the plant's power plant, nitrate of soda from South America, and bulk sulfur, both required for the production of explosives. Early on, explosives were shipped by rail to the mines in Michigan and Minnesota. The Barksdale plant was a major supplier of TNT and of other explosives during both wars and was recognized by the military for their substantial contribution to the war effort. Next. After the Great Depression in 1929, the silence in Washburn brought inevitable layoffs. Millions of tons had been handled during its one half century existence. Mr. Gibson, who came to the dock in 80, 1886, reports that 864 boats were unloaded during the 36 years of his superintendency. Next. The railroad had a six-stall engine house off of Omaha Street <coughs> and a water tank nearby which still stood until the railroad left town. Next. Northwestern Fuel Company coal shipping business gradually tapered off until 1932. They announced that the material handling superstructure would be dismantled. The city pled for them to continue, but to no avail. Twenty-five local men, mostly former employees, worked on the demolition. Next. This entire superstructure was 750 feet long, 600 feet wide by the water, and 46 feet in height, and had 17 steam-driven loading rigs. The structure had about 1 million board feet of lumber and 150 loads of scrap firewood, all which was sold to locals. 400 tons of steel was sold and remelted. Next. Next. Uh, this is a shot from uh, Harry Pesey's diorama up in the Washburn Museum. <coughs> if you haven't seen that, I, uh, I'd recommend it. It's a pretty interesting diorama of the entire waterfront, including the sawmills. Next. Following the demise of the Northwestern Fuel Operation, its superintendent of 36 years, John Gibson, then established Gibson Coal Company, which utilized some of the remaining dock equipment and continued to supply coal in the local area. Gibson Coal Company maintained an office where the Bremer Bank now stands. Following Mr. Gibson's passing, Mrs. Gibson ran the, ran the business for some time supplying coal to local users, including our family. The small coal office building was raised when the Bremer built the new bank. In the 1950s, I recall Ray Brenning backing up our driveway and shooting first bump and later stoker coal into our coal bin. Next. 
During both wars, the railroad was called upon to transport, transport employees to the plant. The bond officials pled with the railroad to provide daily service from Washburn, which it did by creating the Dynamite Limited with two vintage repainted cars. By August 1915 and up to America's entry into World War I, Washburn was a boom town full of speculators and construction workers with a need for housing. DuPont employed over 1,500 workers and the Omaha had to provide 20 coaches and a larger engine, sometimes two. Five trains were run daily. Next. An ancillary use of the dock area in 1921 was for the construction of a steel-hulled, double-ended ferry boat, the Hudson Athens, for use on the Hudson River. Anchor, building, Anchor Shipbuilding Company was organized with a dream to build one of the largest and most complete shipyards on the Great Lakes. It promised to be a coming industry employing at least 100 men. A building 200 feet long and wide and tall enough was constructed to house the ship, which was 115 feet long, 44 feet wide, and 12 feet deep. I didn't catch that. <laughs> On about June 25, 1921, the ship was launched, launched with some difficulty. It got caught and took a while to get it off the skids. Anyway, it finally sent on its way 1,600 miles down the lakes. It was a good and handsome ship which served the Hudson, Athens area for many years. Unfortunately, the shipbuilding company did not survive after having created this one only ship. So, I think we might just, uh, anybody uh, desperate for a little break here? We are supposed to. Ah, okay, forget it. I, at this point, I, I really wanted to play uh, some souvenir views music for you, but our, our thing didn't work there, so I can't do that. I also wanted to thank Warren and uh, Nelson and Betty Ferris, uh, the Nelson Ferris Concert Company, for having created that wonderful musical um, souvenir views, which all of us, or most of us, have enjoyed. <laughs> And they also uh, enlightened us with uh, items of history that probably uh, we never would have known about had they not taken time to research it. So thanks, Warren and Betty. And I wanted to play Long Ships on the Tall Waters, No Flies on Washburn, Where Are the Railroads, and Just a Little Town on the Big Lake, but maybe another time. Uh, could we have some flip through those? Uh, Here's, here's what we were going to see during the time the music was playing. I, I found a whole bunch of, whole bunch of uh, interesting railroad shots, and I just wanted to run through those. Um, the, some of the resource material I've, I was able to glean out of a book that was produced by the Omaha Railroad called the Omaha Line. It had some wonderful old photographs in there, uh, many of which were taken by Chick Sheridan. Here's the water tower. The Washburn Depot, they're approaching the depot. Uh, this guy up here with the derby or the straw hat on is um, John J. Pershing. General John J. Pershing, who had been vacationing in the Apostle Islands, and he had a stop in Washburn, and everybody came out to say hello. There is a train up the Washburn Depot, and there is our roundhouse which actually lasted into my lifetime. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's where you have. I saw the Souvenir Blues thing, and we would not have been able to do Souvenir Blues without you, and Carl, and Jeff, 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 Uh, the homecoming committee was groping for uh, a suitable program for the centennial in 1983. And we knew that Warren and, and Betty had produced this uh, hornpipe thing for their hometown and over in Minnesota. We prevailed upon them to think about doing a program for us and it worked out happily. 
Okay, next, what do we got going, going here? Next. Ah, uh, keep going. There's railroad ones. I think we're almost done with the railroad. Oh, back up one slide. Okay, here's a here's a shot that that building in the, on the lower picture right there is uh, at one time was owned by Olson Building Materials. It's still there. It's where the uh, foundry pattern shop is now. Train tracks ran right ran right by it. There was a door where they could access the storage building. And inside that building is a hand-operated elevator. Did you know that? A, a rope-operated elevator. And I had to run that thing myself a couple of times. And, and these people standing out there are civilian um, conservation corps workers waiting to get transported somewhere. Somewhere where there was woods and lots of mosquitoes. <laughs> Pardon? No, that's, this is a picture looking west. The depot would have been on the east side. I don't know what that other building was down there. I think that's the water tank in the background on the left. Okay, we're ready to move on and there should be a picture of um, Lars Larson. There he is. Lars, a uh, wonderful historian. He, he's got several huge volumes with fantastic detail of the history of Washburn, and so uh, it's a lot to digest. Anyway, this is an article that he wrote about the coal dock in which I've, from which I've plagiarized my materials. Finally, in February of 1937, it was announced by Mayor Hans J. Thompson that the dock would be opened, reopened by the McCullough Dock Coal and Dock Company under the supervision of Joseph McKella of Besmer, Michigan. Next. There's Joseph. Of local note, Joseph's sister in law was Mrs. Joe Rose Garland, who lived next, next to us on Fifth Street. I grew up with the Garland family Bob, Joanne, Nancy, and John. Joanne's here today. Right there. Okay. Next, in May of 1938, a ship arrived with 10,000 tons of coal. At 575 feet in length, it was too long to lay along the 550-foot dock and had to angle in because the foundation of the old elevator dock was in the way. That is not the ship. Operations, operations at the McKellar dock declined in 1939, but resumed again in 1940 when two ships made repeated trips to the city with cargoes of coal. Next. Next. Ah, good, there we go. Two large Caterpillar bucket cranes were employed to unload the ship, controlled by operators who sat in elevated cabs from which they could see inside the holds. Our neighbor Joe Garland operated one of these two cranes. Coal was piled on the dock, then loaded into hoppers, from which it was dumped into large trucks. Next. There's one of the hoppers. Coal was supplied to the pot plant and di distributed throughout northern Wisconsin and Michigan. Truck and train loads of coal were a common sight. The Omaha now Chicago and Northwestern, whose business had languished during the 1930s, benefited from the recovery, which began in 1939, reporting that the volume of business that year was the largest since 1927, that 248 carloads of freight were shipped, mostly of coal from the Washburn dock, but also a few carloads of pulpwood, while 135 carloads of freight were received. Next. Business from the Parksdale Works, handled by the Washburn Freight Office, included 708 carloads received and 704 shipped. There was a further substantial increase in freight business in 1940, and the company continued to operate as freight service to Washburn and the DuPont plant through the 1960s. Next. In 1962, a proposal was considered to infill the dock area from its existing south wall southward 
to the end of the merchandise dock for more space and deeper water in order to accommodate the larger ships and a new south wall to prevent the battering from southwest winds. Obviously, this proposal died since the dock remained in its original form and as it exists today. Next. Joseph McKellar, founder of the McKellar Coal and Dock Company in Besmer and Washburn, passed away in June of 1956. Following his honorable discharge from the Army in 1945, his son Dominic McKellar returned to Besmer and worked in the family business. Upon his father's death in June of 1956, Dominic took over the family business, which he operated in Besmer and Washburn until 1960, when the company was purchased by the Peabody Coal Company. Dominic then continued as dock manager for the new owners. Next. Yeah, I, I'm a little, a little confused here. I, there was something about the Reese Coal Company getting involved in the picture, but now we're not going to sweat the details there. Um, let's see. So this was pretty much the end of the McKellar operation. Next picture. Located on the site of the now defunct dock area, the Washburn Marina was built in 1981 and 1982 was completed in 1983, 100 years after the railroad developed its great lake port. The city of Washburn welcomed a new entity to replace a now redundant coal, grain, and merchandise handling facility. Acquiring the marina funding and public approval was a very complicated process, which could be another program. A bundle of entities were involved in the funding process, which included uh, subsidi subsidiary private investment um, as well as grants including and including the new state bed, the hotel, and several condos, and a second ferry boat to be built on the Washburn dock. Next. The motor vessel Madeline shown here was built in 1983 and in 84 under the supervision of Gary Russell, a principal in the ferry company by area craftsmen for the Madeline Island Ferry Company. The Madeline continues to happily and safely perform its duty between Bayfield and The Rock to this day. Next. Oops, we we're missing a picture. Anyway, in, in 1996, the city had a big to-do uh, celebration of sorts, and Sharon Stewart was instrumental in working on a grant request to the Wisconsin DOT, which was successful. So about 400000 was received to help finance necessary improvements to the storm-battered walls of the existing south and southwest facing dock walls. The placement of sheet pilings and other improvements was desperately needed. The project eventually cost nearly 700000 and has proved uh, preserve that portion of the dock we got to find it, see if we can find a picture. Keep going. There it is. All right, that's the north-south wall of the merchandise dock, and that's sheet piling was put there and on the south end of that in the 1996 operation. Yeah, Nelson, yeah, probably the only, the only company... Uh, Although they have some competition now, I understand. Prior to 2011, severe weather events seriously damaged the south wall of what was the original coal dock, now the marina. Let's try the next picture. That was the, many of you recall, that was a 12 by 12 timbered surface. In the winter of 2011 and spring of 2012, this south wall underwent a major renovation which involved deep underwater restructuring and lots of concrete. Prior to 2018, next picture. Prior to 2018, storm-driven waves had created severe damage to the eastern side of the commercial coal dock and the rock approach to the dock. Next. In 2018, new sheet piling and a steel cap was installed in the north and east, east sides of the commercial dock. Next. New ballots were installed and the inner area was filled and leveled with crushed stone to create a level serviceable surface. 
The entire merchandise dock has been stabilized for posterity and even now is being utilized for a substantial stone moving project. And I regret, I took a photograph of the operation today in the Corps of uh, Engineers crane, a huge crane, and a barge was there loading stone. It was pretty interesting. But I didn't have time to get it in the program, sorry. Anyway, that, that whole area has been stabilized and uh, is back in business. Next. Today, as a result of the marina construction and three major repair efforts beginning in 1996, the entire dock complex of the Omaha Railroad has been improved, preserved, and continues to serve our community, hopefully, for generations to come. Next. One of the finest marinas on Lake Superior with up to 12 employees and a nice lakeshore development replaces the faded dream of the Omaha. But, to their credit, their foresight and investment created our city and played a major role in the development of the Bayfield, Peninsula, Madeline Island, and Ashland. Next. Yeah, there's just a little town. Lovely place. I love this photograph. It's been around for a while. So, I uh, wanted to mention a couple of memories, but before I do, I'd like to, is, like to ask, is there anybody out there who wants to say anything about any part of this? Because you're welcome. So, I want to mention a couple of little memories that I have. Uh, there was, try the next picture. Uh, you know where that American Legion post building is, there's a sign right there, but across the street where that person is standing, there was a little shack there, right? and my grandfather took me down to his boathouse, which is right over the hill on that little beach, when I was about five years old. And one of his brother-in-laws, Roy Eckholm, worked in the little guard shack that stood on that corner. And I always remember, because I was always thirsty, by the time we walked all the way from Fifth, West Fifth Street down to the coal dock, and they had a cold water bubbler in there, and I thought that was the nicest thing. <laughs> so, and then right over the embankment on the beach, and I had a picture, but it didn't get in here, there was about five or six boathouses that were cheap by jowl there, on, squatted on the railroad property, and they lasted into, I'm going to guess the late 50s. They were just, like I say, cheek by jowl. Elmer uh, Olson had one, uh, a Pallage had one, uh, Alvin, uh, Alvin, Alvin Williamson had one, my grandfather, Anton Holman had one. Um, wonderful little place and great, great memories. Uh, well, that is, uh, that concludes my program. And I see you're not interested in adding anything to it, so. Uh, <laughs>